the church really has a habit of taking on projects that are bigger than themselves. Churches are, are really the, you know, the, the driver for uh, community transformation. There's a whole story and a whole miracle to the first building that was bought six weeks into the church. That small church responded to the refugee crisis in this country in 1984. When 200,000 refugees were fleeing the civil war in Mozambique, and uh, they were at the Tungogara camp. And, uh, you know, our church responded. First, really moved by compassion to respond to people that were not clothed, that were not eating, that were fleeing war in their country, that uh, were, uh, didn't have any water. And uh, in, in a few short weeks, uh, we became the biggest distributor of food uh, within the country. I don't think we were prepared for what lay ahead. Um, I think over 64,000 people uh, came to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And what we didn't realize was that was a seed. The Mozambican uh, church actually started out of uh, uh, Pastor Tom's uh, uh, heart and initiative to assist the refugees uh, who came into Zimbabwe during the 15-year uh, civil war in Mozambique. But we also have a church here in Maputo, uh, which was also planted 16 years ago. And after that, we saw a church plant in Matola and Chimoyo. In Tete province, which are the older churches, uh, we have 19 churches, and then in Chimoyo, uh, or the Madika area rather, we have got uh, nine churches. So all together, uh, you know, that is about uh, um, uh, 30 churches in Mozambique. The story of these shows how even with limited resources, when there is a great vision, people kind of catch it and run with it, uh, and mobilize themselves and stand up and, 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 and do incredible things. So this is what uh, what I would say, you know, it's, it's a sense of something great happening uh, here. The expansion of the church can really be broken down into three phases. The first was the refugee crisis and the expansion into Mozambique. The second expansion started with a miracle. Someone was raised from the dead in Chitungi. One of our church members had gone to uh, visit a family member who uh, was sick in hospital. And uh, upon arrival, uh, they were not told, uh, but their family member had passed away. So all they did, and they didn't understand that once the sheet is covered, and that, that means the person is gone. So what they did was uh, they got there, and obviously the sheet was covered, covered their head. They knew that was their family member. They spoke to them, they didn't respond. And then they just laid hands on them and they prayed for them uh, to be healed. And uh, the brother came back from the dead. News began to spread so quick. And that's how uh, the churches in Shitungiza were birthed. We really bought into the vision because we sensed that we could do the same under their umbrella, just under their covering, we could do the same. So evangelism was right at the top, and obviously we needed to expand the church. And that's why we ended up planting three churches, and at the moment we are pushing for the fourth one. So expansion was key. God began to speak to us. Use soca because men love soccer. Manje, manje. They are going to congregate around uh, the soccer field. Manje, manje. In fact, you create an audience once you have a ball and people kicking around and you put supporters. That's where you can find your life. Manje, manje. 
And I'm glad to report that today we have surpassed 10,000 souls. The, the third phase is, for me, what I'd like to term the scattering phase. That is, the people who are leaving Zimbabwe, those who had the economic means or the qualifications, the great brain drain, as they say, uh, will leave in the country to look for greener pastures and greater opportunities outside the country. When we left Zim, um, I was 13. I heard that there was a celebration church um, starting in London. Um, and the rest is really history. We've been, you know, my family's been a part of Celebration Church since. Uh, so those people began to reach back. We began to say, hey guys, why don't you meet as a cell? And those cells soon grew to churches. And we then we began to encourage others uh, who were outside the country to follow the same model, to plant uh, a starter cell, then plant a church when they grow big enough. And you know, that's how Johannesburg Church, Pretoria Church, uh, Cape Town Church came into the picture. Botswana and Haveroni, that's how Nairobi, Kenya came in. Now we're in Dubai, we're in the UK, um, we're in Mozambique, we're in Zambia, and, and, and Namibia. And, you know, the, the list keeps growing of, of people that were once here that were scattered abroad, that are connected first in South and then became churches. You know, we, we quickly realized that there was uh, a need for a more um, localized um, approach and, and, and a fresh expression of what church could look like um, in a society like this. Um, and, and that was, you know, on the backdrop of what the Axe Church looked like. And so we kind of embarked on a journey um, looking at how we can redef redefine um, the vehicle of what church is um, and and we landed on this idea of a cafe we wanted to create a space where people could belong even before they believe um, a place where people could be a part of community and sense and experience that love of God and that sense of community and that sense of belonging that sense of home the pattern in scripture is there, that under persecution, the church grows. And uh, we've experienced it over the 40 years in celebration, that under persecution, uh, the church continued to grow. And uh, I think um, in, the, in the future, as the world gets darker, I think that's a wonderful opportunity for the light to even shine brighter. Suddenly, you know, the whole world closed up. So we knew that there would be an immediate need for food. The Celebration Church in Maidstone does more than nourish the soul of its congregation. It literally feeds them by encouraging them to cook for themselves. The church in Parkwood started providing weekly hot meals to the community last year after the first lockdown. Over the course of the first two lockdowns, we delivered 8,000 cooked meals to any family that needed it in that season. And I, when I say a cooked meal, I mean a starter, a main course and a dessert cooked and delivered fresh to the door to any family that needed it over that time. But it wasn't ever just about the food. We were connecting relationally with some of these families. We were there to support them, not just with food, but through relationship, through connection, through you know, encouraging them through one of the toughest seasons that people have gone through. And there was life, there was church happening every day. We knew that it needed to be, um, needed to be the salt and the light in the community. And that meant that we had to kind of let go of the comfort of the four walls of the church building. And in doing so, you know, with, with the Holy Spirit leading us, we've built a family in the heart of this community. To see uh, that the power of God can be released to deliver people and to be able to get to a place where they can be taught the word, they can be transformed, and they can believe themselves and say, hey, I can do much better than 
what I've been doing before. I can see myself as a different person. Maybe now, as a new person in Christ, I can believe for greater things. We've gone into communities where there have been high drug problems, um, high morality problems, um, poverty levels that cannot be described. And you can only change those communities one person at a time, one family at a time. We've got a church that is full of uh, people with hope. So I think it's, it's critical that we tell more stories of what God has done uh, in our midst. There is a great work ahead of us.